In 1958, with Commander William Anderson as captain, Nautilus spent four days under the Arctic ice, going from the Pacific to the Atlantic and passing directly under the North Pole. On her first charge of uranium fuel, Nautilus steamed 62,500 miles. More than half the distance was traveled fully submerged. For a conventional submarine of this size, more than two million gallons of fuel oil would have been required. Following Nautilus was Seawolf. The Seawolf's nuclear propulsion plant, which was cooled by liquid sodium, was designed, developed, and built by the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory, connected in New York, which the General Electric Company operates for the AEC. Seawolf first got underway on 21 January 1957. She operated successfully for almost two years on her sodium plant, steaming a total of 71,611 miles. In 1958, she completed a record-breaking 60-day submerged run. However, the pressurized water reactor proved superior for naval applications, and further work on sodium-cooled reactors as a means for propelling naval ships was abandoned. So in 1960, her sodium plant was replaced by a plant similar to that installed in Nautilus. All subsequent naval nuclear propulsion plants have been of the pressurized water type. In the meantime, a more advanced and simplified reactor was developed by the Atomic Energy Commission. This plant, designated as the Submarine Fleet Reactor, was installed in the attack submarines Skate, Swordfish, Sargo, and Sea Dragon, and the missile firing halibut. Again, new records were written, new areas explored. Skate made the first transatlantic voyage to England and back while submerged. Later, she explored the polar seas. And in 1958, she went around the world in 50 minutes on a circular course one mile from the North Pole. Sargo spent 31 days under the ice cover exploring this almost uncharted sea. Sea Dragon was first to transit the Northwest Passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific in 1960. Skate and Sea Dragon met and carried out combined operations around the pole in 1962 and won the praise of President Kennedy for their conquest of inner space. They had shown that the ice-bound seas of the pole were accessible, that the Arctic could be used as an operational area for nuclear-powered submarines in all seasons. The USS Triton, one of the largest submarines ever built, 448 feet long, 7,700 tons. Triton added new records to the impressive list of achievements of nuclear-powered submarines. Skippered by then Commander Edward Beach, she made history in 1960 by circling the world underwater, 36,000 miles in 84 days. And at no time was Triton detected by our own or any other forces. Continuing advances in nuclear power plants combined with improvements in hull design and the development of a solid-fueled Polaris missile produced the dramatic and strategically potent Fleet Ballistic Missile Weapons System. Single propeller submarines with higher speeds and improved handling characteristics carry 16 Polaris missiles capable of reaching any land-based target on Earth. George Washington in 1959 was the first. The others also bear the names of American patriots. Able to operate submerged for months, to cruise indefinitely at high, sustained speeds, difficult to detect. They patrol the seas by day and night, the closest assurance to an ultimate deterrent in the world today. While the nuclear submarines were writing naval history with every voyage, a nuclear propulsion plant capable of propelling large surface ships was being developed by the AEC. A prototype of this plant was constructed at the National Reactor Testing Station near Idaho Falls, Idaho. And the Navy's first nuclear-powered surface ship 
the cruiser Long Beach, which is powered by a modified version of the large ship reactor, was taking shape in the Bethlehem shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. In September 1961, Long Beach was commissioned. Possessing all the attributes of nuclear power, Long Beach can keep to the seas almost indefinitely and can operate at high sustained speeds far beyond the capability of conventional ships. Her naval tactical data system and other complex electronic equipment supply almost instant answers to complicated tactical problems. Conventional weapons and missile launchers give a powerful protective response in anti-air and anti-submarine operations. Two months after the Long Beach was commissioned, the carrier Enterprise put to sea nearly 86,000 tons, the largest and fastest warship in the world, with a flight deck covering four and a half acres. Her eight nuclear reactors produce in excess of 200,000 shaft horsepower to drive her across the seas of the world at speeds in excess of 30 knots. Because the Big E needs no fuel oil to run her reactors, she can carry extra aircraft fuel and ordnance to keep aircraft operating longer than similar fossil fuel carriers. As with all nuclear-powered surface ships, the absence of smokestacks and corrosive gases vastly decreases maintenance problems and permits the use of more effective fixed array antennas. And flying conditions are improved by the freedom from smoke and hot gases across the deck. A wide range of armament, speed, and detection facilities make the nuclear carrier less vulnerable to attack. The third nuclear-powered surface ship, Bainbridge, a guided missile frigate, was commissioned in October 1962 and further demonstrated the advantage of nuclear propulsion for combatant surface ships. With her speed, endurance, and specialized weapons, she is well equipped for her task of providing a shield against enemy air or submarine attacks, or to operate efficiently on independent missions. In the early summer of 1964, Enterprise, Long Beach, and Bainbridge were deployed to the Mediterranean, assigned to the Sixth Fleet to form the world's first nuclear-powered task force. On 31 July, the three ships were designated as Task Force One, with orders to carry out Operation Sea Orbit. The cruise was to demonstrate the capability of these nuclear-powered ships to maintain high speeds for indefinite distances in all environments of weather and seas without refueling or replenishing of any kind. To demonstrate the strategic mobility and utility of this element of U.S. power, to show these powerful modern ships and aircraft to people in remote areas of the world, to demonstrate the ability to reinforce U.S. power quickly in remote areas with a force ready to fight. To show the ships and their facilities to military and government leaders along the track of the orbit, distinguished guests from Africa, Asia, Australia, and South America were flown aboard on 16 different occasions. After they were given suitable honors, they were escorted around the ships. And later, from the reviewing stand, they saw a demonstration of some of the capabilities of the men and weapons of the nuclear task force. The course of sea orbit followed around the coasts of Africa and up to Pakistan south and east to Australia and New Zealand, continuing easterly along the Roaring Forties, around Cape Horn, up the coast of South America, and on to Norfolk. It was a track that passed through all the seasons, crossing the equator four times, and coming within 500 miles of the Antarctic continent. From New Zealand to Cape Horn, more than 5,200 miles, the ships maintained a steady 26 knots, and there was plenty of power in reserve. 